What's up, you absolute psychopaths? Welcome back to the highway with Kyle Shutt. I am the wild man himself, and I am so happy to be here. The sword has tour dates on the calendar. Things are looking brighter. We're about to have a good-ass time, y'all. But before then, let's have a, a different kind of good-ass time. Uh, this week on the program, we got Mr. Mike Weeby, singer of Riverboat Gamblers, Dracula's, freaking Ghost Knife, if you remember them. He's been in every band. If you've ever seen a band, you've seen this man. Uh, he's uh, done a lot of stand-up gigs with me. He's one of my one of my really good friends, and I, I hope you all enjoy what we have to talk about this week. We're going to talk about uh, Denton, Texas, which is kind of a suburb of Dallas, about their house party scene. We're going to talk about all the, uh, the, just the different kinds of... Uh, punk rock that came out of texas it's it's a lot to cover we're gonna get to the bottom of it as always y'all know the deal if you want to go ahead and hit that follow button or, or the subscribe tab or if there's any kind of bell or whistle you can pull it really helps this show out and if you want to go one step further you can find us at patreon.com slash the highway for as little as two bucks a month you can get yourself a shout out like code runner like Chris Simpson, and you can even uh, give a little bit more and put a six-pack of beer in my fridge this week for a dedicated six-pack shout-out. This week, I gotta thank Taylor Ellis. Thank y'all so much. You, you, every single one of y'all makes my day. We also have to give all the love in the world to our sponsors, Heil Sound, because if you like the way I sound, it's because there's a Heil in front of me. And that is the end of the fine print, ladies and gentlemen. It's time to do things my way. The Highway. Hey, buddy. What's going on? Mike Weeby, everybody, from all, every band. Aren't you yeah, in every single I'm band? Most, I'm in, in most the- of them. <laughs> <laughs> if, if there's a band uh, out there that didn't make a lot of money, I was in it. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but seriously, Riverboat Gamblers, Draculas, uh, you do comedy, you're in the McEwens, you started doing a, uh, an international news service. Yeah, uh, podcast all about uh, wacky uh, true news stories. Uh, yeah, but he, he we does mostly it all, just we mostly just like uh, make fun of each other. Most of my podcast, I've got another podcast coming out called Zach and Mike Make Three as well, and mostly it's just li- like as with the music, as with the comedy, it's just mostly me dicking around, which is my main my that that's my skill set. You and me both, brother. <laughs> yes. and one of these days i'm going to find something that that works but until then i'm just going to do a little bit of everything uh, but uh yeah man uh, it's it's kind of funny that we're both i uh I, I guess you could say uh austin music i hate to use the word royalty but i'm going to go ahead and use it well, Austin <laughs> music royalty uh we've been around for a long long time but we weren't uh, necessarily friends uh until the last couple of years so it's been a real pleasure getting to know you and it was um uh, JT Haversat really that kind of I think brought us together uh, doing stand up comedy, which yeah. um, which I think doing, is funny because every shows. every yeah every guy in a band wants to be a comedian and every comedian wants to be in a band so it's a you know it's not too much of a stretch I don't yeah. think going is stepping into the comedy world it must, probably easier for you because you were a front man uh, front front person however yeah you want to put but it. it's but, uh, kind before, of but you know. I think it was it's kind of though the like skateboarding to snowboarding you think that there's a lot of parallels but then when you get out there because i was a skateboarder and when i tried snowboarding it was just a disaster and it was kind of it was similar (laughs) to that like there's yeah you're standing up and you're trying to go fast uh, down a hill but the mechanics are completely and totally different and you eat shit a whole lot uh (laughs) But but I like it though. It's super fun. It's nice to. I mean, the best thing about comedy is you don't have to load equipment in. <laughs> I was gonna say it's hard to kick flip a snowboard. Yeah, but yeah, you know, you, very. We keep trying. We keep trying. Uh, one of my yeah, one of the best parts about doing a stand up tour is that you can just show up after doors. Oh no yeah, worries. <laughs> totally. You just roll up, and you can also like leave way earlier, which is. I remember uh-huh. I used to always be like in. With band stuff, I used to love being the last guy there. I wanted to like hang out with as many people as possible and just soak in the night. And now it's like, and not that I want to leave like super early, but it's 
it's nice to not have to be there until like you know 2 a.m and and then load out stuff and wait for a grumpy guy to to pay you in the back room the crowds are different too they're it's not like they're less fun to talk to but i feel like after um after a band plays it's much more of uh, i don't know like a much more of like a religious experience, you know, where it was like everyone in yeah. the room was really super affected at a comedy show. Sometimes it just, it, you never know what's going to happen. You know, yeah. like a, everybody's a sense of humor is completely subjective, you know, and, and uh, it's, it's different. It's just different. Yeah. It's really, it's weird with, um, with music, it, you know, if there's a bunch of people there and unless we're opening for some, band that is really really off genre for like you know the even even in the vaguest of you know like if it's some weird festival and and it's clear that everyone's waiting just waiting in front of our stage because you know i don't know cottonmouth kings or something are going up next like i can as long as there's people there I, i'm pretty confident that it's gonna go it's gonna go well assuming like we in the band don't mess up but with comedy like man you never know it could it just things if there's a large crowd there you could just not do well and you can you can feel it immediately when it's not going right uh-huh. totally i uh it it, it 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 definitely took me a minute to get my sea legs kind of telling tour stories and it's sort of i i don't know doing the road stories is kind of like cheating because we were really just like just goofing off on the dumb shit that we did i'm not really like crafting jokes but there is a certain amount of like storytelling skill that you have to exercise you know, oh when, for when, sure for sure yeah, and definitely like, you you i mean because i've i've been doing those a while before you even kind of jumped on so i've seen a lot of a lot of musicians try it that it's not it's not that great a lot of times but you you actually you like right on kind of you kind of you had the you knew what to do kind of right when you got up there i think like you kind of had the knack for just to, i am just a, to make it entertaining you know thank you i i, I am a stand up fan i've been watching stand up since uh I mean, the early '90s, whenever like A and E had like Evening at the Improv and, oh, yeah. and uh, the A List and stuff on TV. So I mean, I, I've been a stand-up fan my whole life. So it's kind of one of those things where it's like you know, you see it done enough times, you you know what to do, whether or not you're going to be good at it. Like you know what sucks and what doesn't. You know. Yeah. But, um, that, at but least I've, I've definitely yeah seen people bomb. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah, and it's weird. Like you know, just I think sometimes people. You just get nervous up there. Like I think that there's mm-hmm. a level of like, especially for musicians, where you are used to all the noise that um, mm-hmm. you're not comfortable with silence at all. And that's something that took a little bit to get used to. Like get get used to the pauses and and be able to bounce back when something doesn't work immediately or whatever. That's the key for sure. Uh, and and also just you're as a musician, I, I don't think you're used to hearing only your voice. Yeah. And, in the PA. And so if you start to listen to your voice, it can kind of like hypnotize you and you just sort of like get stuck. You know, it's, it's a little weird, but once you get used to it, it's easy. You just kind of have to let everything go and just not care. I I think that's a huge part of it is just, just don't care. Yeah. That's exactly. And it's so much harder to do than, than, than just in theory yet to, to not care because you have to care enough to get up there and do it, but to also, I don't know. I'm just. I really am trying to look at it always like a failure is like just a good learning tool, and really try and go like, mm-hmm. all right, well, what did I do wrong there? Where where did that yeah. go wrong? And hopefully learn something from it. It's it it's so much easier to be in a band, or I guess playing the show is, but everything else about being in the band is so much harder. Yeah, <laughs> just the totally. wrangling everybody's schedules, getting getting all the gear, ordering all the merch, like even booking the tour can be a fucking nightmare. Oh man. Yeah. Uh, you know, and stuff like that. Let's talk about, yeah, like how you, like what, what made you want to sing in a punk rock band? Like, what, what yeah, like where'd that come from? In, uh, in well, I actually, I think I, I, I was, I grew up in Denton, Texas, and there was a bunch of cool, like underground bands in town. Cause I, I think like music always seemed, I didn't really grow up doing anything with music. Um, it always seemed kind of inaccessible and like, you're just like, and I'm also like pretty guilty of like trying things. And if I'm not immediately uh, have like 
obvious aptitude for it, I'll just be like, I'm done with this. But uh, I think I kind of <laughs> did that with music initially. I was like, I don't know. There's there's so many strings, and um, <laughs> the the uh, so I did. I was like a acting student, and I went to college for a couple years. And but when I, I came home once that second year, um, and some friends, Fadi El Assad, who's in the Riverboat Gamblers. And another friend that they were both still in high school, and I was like two years into college, and they had a band going. And I think I had done something more of like a comedy act with uh, the other guy, a student named Mike Cersei. And we did like a musical, sort of a, it was like just me and him. He had a bass, I had a guitar, we had a drum machine, and it was mostly just really kind of just goofy joke songs. But when I came back, like him and Foddy and this kid Travis had a band, and it was like, you know, it was real, like they had like real songs, you know, that had that. that I mean, they were, it was still kind of funny stuff, but uh, very like fat rack kind of uh, screeching weasel type, you know, Ramones clone knockoff kind of stuff. Um, uh, it was, it was like, so this was like 90 six ish i guess and um in that kind of like gilman uh, my buddy calls it the gilman gold rush when like all the pop punk <laughs> bands suddenly got like this this big thing and and i was in the, at the time pretty into that stuff as most people i think my age were and uh and so yeah i just got like so and they they kind of showed me how to play some stuff and i i joined the band as like kind of guitar player singer but i totally was like Tim Armstrong in it, where I just like play a chord and sing a whole bunch, and then just kind of the guitar was more there for show. Um, yeah, but uh, but yeah, so that just kind of that just kicked it off. But anyway, you know, and and instead of going back to school, like it was like I don't have to audition anymore. Like I don't have to audition to get in a show. Like we were just like immediately like that the Denton scene was really really happening at the time, and all these all these bands were touring from all over the you know, all over the world, really, and playing these house shows in Denton, Texas. Like, for, for some reason, that it was kind of bigger to play a house... In that scene, it was bigger to play the a house show in Denton, Texas than it was to go play a club in Dallas. And, like, I was, you know, like, at the drive-in and Jimmy World and all these, you know, all those fat... Not all the fat... Like, some the bigger fat rec bands would play a club, but, like, a lot of the the you know lesser big ones that were still like super big to a ton of people and it would be these house shows where it would be you know an easy like 200 people at this house show like you couldn't get in to the show like it was just these huge crowds and and it was a couple of these houses were just in these locations that they were kind of far enough away from other people like one was in the total in the hood and nobody was going to call the cops out there and then the other was just at the end of this like kind of field area uh the end it was like the last house on this block and everything to the right was a field and i guess the neighbors didn't care and across the street was just like a was like a a strip mall that was closed by that time so there was like plenty of parking for all the people which is like park at this strip mall and it was just i was super lucky and i kind of at the time i thought like this is probably going on in every single town and this like (laughs) and then by the time you know like three or four years later when i actually started getting to tour it was like oh no this is not this is a kind of that was a this is a weird little magical bubble that i didn't know was gonna but it was crazy like dude there was there was shows in those years like there there were shows like in the summers especially there would be like three or four shows a week at between those two houses. And then there was one club that was doing shows in town and there would, it was every single show was packed. It wasn't like, um, it wasn't just like, Oh, I know this band. So I'm going to see it because it was a house show. And it was just like, I think exciting for people to be a part of this, like punk rock scene. Like if, if you, if there was, you know, on the, the band, it would be like, you know, whatever the, the, the carburetor boys from Cleveland. And it was just, it was less the band name and the fact that there was somebody from another town coming to these shows that was playing in this house and everyone was super excited. But man, it was crazy. We had like these, this band from Japan was called, they're called Jackie and the Cedrics. I don't know if they do anything anymore. They're like a, they were like an instrumental surf trio. 
And, like, they they flew in and played, like, three shows in the L.A. area, then flew to Denton, Texas and played a house show, and then flew to New York and played, like, three shows out there. And they, like, all... It was... it was, And they didn't speak English at all. I have no idea how they even made it to this just, just squat house, almost, in the middle of the Denton hood called the Wannabe Manor. And it was... I don't... It, just weird stuff... Things like that happened that, like, I at the time I completely took for granted, and now it's kind of like, man, that was such a weird anomaly. Do you even know how that happened? Like, I mean, like, because uh, back in the day, in those, I mean, the l- mid late nineties, like, one way that you could book your own tour was on the the back page of Maximum Rock and Roll. Yeah, was book your own fucking life, and it became a you know a website too. At once the internet kind of took hold. But is, do you think that's how that kind of took off, or like, who, um, who even like booked I, these shows? I don't know. I think it, you know, not, I mean, it got to the point where like we, we had to become these like vicious at, at the various houses kind of become these like, these like, you know, tastemaker booking agents because there would just be like, there would be so many bands trying to get on. And then, cause it, at the first couple of years we weren't vetting it at all. And then at some point, it was just so many people, like, you just had to kind of start vetting it. So you would kind of check out and see if the band was any good or whatever. Um, or and, and I think, like, that Japan one was the guys... So the guys that were in that band, The Marked Men, uh, they had a band before The Marked Men called The Reds. And before that, they had a, a band called The Oddfells that were, like, a surf trio. And those guys were, like, super super knowledgeable about like the kind of estrus garage rock world before I ever was and and they like I don't know somehow made some kind of connection and those 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 bands came but those houses like I mean there would be like the emoist of emo-y bands there would be like garage rock bands there would be like goth bands there was like a whole hardcore scene and all these all these scenes that like you know when I moved to Austin uh, in the early 2000s, like all those scenes were, I mean, people knew each other and were friendly and there was, there was some crossover, but there was, there was like no division in those scenes whatsoever. Like everybody, like it was like the young ones where like every house kind of had one version of punk rock guy living there. (laughs) You know, there'd be like a mod guy, a crusty guy, a, you know, a big giant jeans and, and chain wallet, like fat wreck kid and then like some you know super i don't know some super just weirdo art rocker and it would be kind of like they would all have one guy so like and it was it was all the same group of people that were going to all these shows so like i i saw every like style of what was going on at the time whereas opposed like and granted i was a little bit older uh and had more of like you know things that I could do but when I moved to you know five years later six years later when I moved to Austin I was you know tended to go to more stuff that was closer to especially when I'm paying money and it's not a show that I put on like or or that my friends at my friend's house like it was I was you know kind of going to more like well I'm gonna go to like you know I kind of know these metal bands and and these like punk bands and these garage rock bands and I tended to just go on that but like I saw so much weird stuff that I never would have seen that even if I didn't like it I still liked being a part of it back then Uh uh-huh man I miss those days I know I know and it's the last time I went to a house show I felt so fucking old oh my god (laughs) I I was like I was like I need to get the fuck out of here right (laughs) Yeah, uh, it and is, even that was like twelve years ago. Yeah, I know, oh I God. know. It it is super weird, and there's no, um, there's no going back. Like, there's no you can't you can't, you know. Like sometimes on the road, you see like a like a guy maybe from that era or later that's like married with kids now, and that's great. But when uh-huh. they come out, they want to try and recreate that one of those nights that you had back then and it's just like come on man you don't have to get you know you got a kid at home you don't need to piss your pants by drinking tonight again that was <laughs> that was funny we can have fun we just have to have a, and we can have we can have fun and we can do music stuff and we can even drink and we can even party but we just we should do it 
It's not lamer to do it in in a you know for me I'm I'm 45. It's not lamer to do that in a 45 year old manner. Like I don't I don't like yeah. I don't want to. Even though I completely miss that kind of golden time, I also don't want to try and re. There's nothing sadder than like well. I'm a little overweight now, but I'm gonna put my skinny jeans on, and I'm, uh, you know, I got, <laughs> I got the tricep, uh, tricep fat going, but I'm still gonna wear my cut off. You know, just dress. You can dress cool, but not dress like you're 22 anymore. Yeah, he's got to find well, that also, new, there's no... new cool. <laughs> the, the new cool. That's a good. The new name. cool. That's the name of my self help book. <laughs> <laughs> uh you said um you know, there's no going back and that's uh, that's true in more ways than one especially once you get in a band and you're part of these local scenes and you're really you know tight with everybody you know but, but this i i don't know if this is true for you but um i i know the second you hit the road and all of a sudden you're not a local band anymore it's really hard to go back to that scene like the people just look at you differently and they yeah and then you find out they're fucking talking about you when you're not around and yeah shit like that is that uh, especially in the punk scene uh, yeah i remember you know. yeah totally we'd get back and either suddenly people either liked us too much or like didn't like us anymore um as people or even, you don't you know? know anybody at your shows anymore you know what i mean like you yeah. look out at your show and you, you don't know a single person there you're like oh yeah okay, this is weird <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a weird feeling too, for sure. Um, and and it's weird now to be on the so far on the other end of it of kind of doing the the professional uh, kind of route, you know. While still, there's definitely uh, I, there's still a, a foot in the in the in the DIY a little bit, um, and you know, not and not out of choice. I believe me, I would definitely I would <laughs> definitely have someone else take care of all that bullshit if I could afford to but it, it is weird to you know because sometimes people will, like ask me about like what the hot new thing is band or what's going on in Austin and I'll go like ah, I don't I don't know you know I, I really don't know and or um because that you know I'm always like man you know that my favorite I, I I caught myself I don't say it as much anymore but I, I a couple times would say that like my favorite thing in Austin I was like oh these this this band these these kids uh, a giant dog and then I was like that band's a decade old they're like a solid you know right and and I mean they're like the the class behind I mean I, I think that band's super great but like they're not like a young band anymore like they're like seasoned mm -hmm. they're seasoned road dogs that have done all types of stuff they're not like a new thing yeah. and I'm like oh yeah I'm just super fucking old man. My favorite new band in Austin was uh, Rickshaw Billy's Burger Patrol, and yeah. uh, before yeah the, the pandemic happened, we were, I, I think I can say it. Fuck it, who cares? Uh, you know, we, the sword was going to go on a big tour with Primus, but we also had a bunch of dates that we hadn't announced yet, and I was going to uh, bring that band out to kind of give them a taste of, you know, playing big clubs and, and just yeah. kind of getting their name out there and stuff. Because I think it's important for more established bands to take out complete unknowns that they just really dig yeah and, totally. uh, and to pay that forward because there's certainly been bands that you know took us out yeah uh, back when we were nothing absolutely nobodies and uh the, you know i think it's important to remember that yeah totally i just yeah i mostly just want to play with with bands that are fun to hang out with that's so much more a criteria yeah. for me than anything i mean i want the, totally. the, the the show package to be good but it's mostly just like man i just want to people that i'm excited to hang out with every day uh-oh, are we going to go there? Are, are, are we going to talk about playing shows with bands that aren't fun to hang out with? We can. We absolutely can. <laughs> I tried. Okay, so this podcast, I try to keep it real positive and real happy, but we're a lot of episodes deep. And you know what? We haven't talked about the dark side of being on yeah. tour with a band that, that you think is going to be a good idea, and it looks good on paper, and you may even be getting paid really well. And you, you say things to yourself like, well... I don't really like the band that much, but you know, like it'll be good for our, our image. You know, it'll, it'll help us get, you know, other kinds of tours. It'll help us yeah. get different kinds of fans and you go on the tour and it's a fucking disaster. Yeah. And it's a total nightmare. <laughs> we, we don't have to name names if you don't want to, but, uh, I'll, man, I'll, I, I know there, one name I'll happily name. I don't, don't care. <laughs> Do it. 
because I know I think I know what you're gonna say. Some forty one. Jesus Christ. Yes. Uh, I mean, just... when you when you get into, like like you're talking about the 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 Gilman Gold Rush, that was a really hilarious yeah uh, phrase. But like that band came around like ten years after that. Totally, you know, er, er, around then, you know what I mean. So whereas like pop punk had been uh, just you know sent through the ringer so many times and just redone and this and that and this uh, all, all of a sudden like punk or emo or whatever d- was not what it used to be. And it was this whole different fucking thing. Yeah. And like the egos that came along with those huge bands that got said, yeah. oh my God, I can only imagine. But please go ahead, man. Like, well, I mean, just, you know, it was, that was a tour that was like, it was, it was in Europe and we're like, oh, this is, didn't really want to. And I like, you know, I don't actively listen to a lot of pop punk at all anymore, but there's stuff that I still like and stuff that I still, um, that I still respect, even if I don't listen to. And there's some stuff that I still uh, like. And there's also some stuff that there's definitely and mo- there's more stuff that I'm like, you know, this is this is a good a good enough crossover kind of thing or whatever. But that was one that I was like, oh, I'm just not a fan of this at all. Like I can't even. There's not much about this that I can justify other than being getting to go on Europe and knowing what their their fan base is that it, that there was a chunk of people there and um man they just they and there was it was like it was a, shows to a lot of people who they they acted like they cared when they played but they didn't they didn't show that care when they went to the merch <laughs> booth afterwards <laughs> at all but we i mean like there were good things about it we made like good friends with like uh, Jim from Pennywise had this side band with with Mark from Dropkick, and there were some kids uh, in this band called Veer that were really great. That were just like like just the sweetest kids. And I, you know, and I've I've definitely done plenty of shows. I'm sure you have too, where like the opening band isn't particularly friendly, but they're not like dicks. Like these guys, not all of them, but like that singer guy was such like just. It, you, it was just so, such. It, it's it's just such it's so weird to be condescended to by somebody who you don't respect at all to begin with. Like it's such <laughs> like a weird pill to swallow. And there was just so much like the craziest thing of these these kind of like you know tour manager tour managers who would kind of like float in the room and try to like make us. Uh, have reverence towards the the singer guy who ne- like the craziest thing to be on it's not that oh i'm i why aren't we best friends but like you're out with the band for like six weeks and like i just you you're just you can make eye contact with me like it's not like it, it just it, the weirdest just to have somebody not make eye contact but there was a huge to do about who was allowed to eat when and it was very important that singer guy that was supposed yeah, to eat before everyone. Thing. Yeah. And um and to the point where um all the food would be laid out and everyone would be hungry, uh-huh. but singer guy yep. was doing an interview with some Germans whatever and it was just this giant I mean this you know three band three other bands worth of because it was it's kind of like a big tour it was like the East Pack ba- backpack like through this this tour or whatever and so there was there was three openers and like all three openers with all of our crews were were supposed to like wait and at some point we were just like no that's not gonna happen and I don't think that there had ever been a mutiny of that sorts before and the their tour manager was this dude who was like supposedly best friends with one of the Nickelback guys. I don't know. Maybe that was something people just said to make fun of it. And he just threw a, <laughs> he threw an absolute fit and he called all the bands together and was like, you do not disrespect the the the, the man who once bedded Avril Lavigne in my presence by eating a oh food. My so God. I, I have that one song that I'm just like for the rest of the tour, anytime we hear that everyone would just look at each other and go you cannot eat any of our food you cannot eat any of our food (laughs) dude that is such a super common thing i can't tell you how many times we've done tours like that where we were yeah like 
like the the tour manager like takes it upon themselves to instruct you how you're to behave and shit like that is just fucking such bullshit. And I've I've heard this didn't happen to me personally, but I've definitely heard stories uh, of other bands like being told that they can't sound check because the the headlining band is trying to eat and they don't want any noise while they're trying to eat. So that you, now you Jeez. can't sound check because that's when they get to. Eat. I mean, like shit like that. That happens. I want a name. Just, uh, I want a name on the band that says White that. Zombie. Oh White man. Zombie. I know, I know. The, I don't want to hear. Uh, that. I won't say. Yeah, I won't say who told me that story, but yeah, it was fucking wise on me. And uh, you know, it's just things like that where it's just like once your ego gets to the point where you're controlling other people's diets, like what the like aren't yeah. we? Why did you get in this in the first place? Like, and then, weren't you know, we all hungry? Hear stuff like, you, don't you remember being a hungry artist? You fucking asshole! Like, ah, oh, whatever, man. I'll hear stuff about like like Ian that's in the Gamblers. Uh, you know, he worked for. Uh, Foo Fighters and like those guys are the they're like the biggest band rock band now and they th- th- I guarantee you that would never happen in their world they would never like they they're like the coolest dudes and, or you know girls like the coolest guy and that's something that just would never go down where it's it's yeah. always like the mid level kind of thing where it's it's a big band but they're not they're not that big they're like the biggest bands yeah. are just gonna be like yeah whatever there's a go go eat. You gotta eat. Yeah, when we were out with Metallica, like we were literally allowed to do anything we wanted, and Metallica loved uh, us playing when they did, and the whole crew loved us playing at, at seven p.m. because that was when they were all eating dinner, and they were like, "You were our dinner band for like a whole year. It was great." Yeah, <laughs> so, I mean, it's like, yeah, like like these biggest bands in the world, like, not like that they have the right to act that way, but you'd think that you know, yeah, if, if anybody was, was going to act that it, way, it, it would, would be the be... tippy top, you know? Yeah, yeah. but yeah. Would be I guess somebody's uh, compensating for something, whatever that may be. Yeah, but, yeah. Who who fucking knows? What was it like? Um, did you did y'all hit Europe very often? Because I, I've heard a lot of different bands have. I mean, every band has a different experience, but um, a, a lot of bands, especially in the the metal scene, talked about you know like the, Europe being their bread and butter, like where their shows were so much better in Europe that they couldn't have survived as a band if it wasn't for their European gigs, uh, rather than like just slogging it out in the States for so long. Did, did the gamblers have that experience or was it more like, uh, were, was the States more your, uh, we, your territory? We messed up real bad in that we did a European tour really early and it went really well and it was, it was going really good. And then we waited way too long to go back. Cause we, uh, we had, uh, just like contract, just, there was just stuff, and we were like, well, we got to wait. I think we went over there before... I wonder what we had out. We we definitely... I think we had one record. We were waiting for something to come out and have... We were trying to get a label to put out a record over there, and we thought that that was, like, really important at the time. And then the next thing you knew... And there was, like, a lot... There was tons of tours, and we were always working, but the next thing you knew, it was, like, five years later, and that... Really, oh, oh yeah really stunted us really really bad um so then and then for a while there we were going pretty regularly but it was always like i i i always felt that we really lost a lot of momentum from uh mm-hmm. not going on that first time like by the time we started going back like you know that whole wave of like because we kind of like i kind of look at things as like there was like that there was like the the that grunge wave and then there was that like Gilman Gold Rush and then we kind of got a little bit of wake and scooped up in uh, like that White Stripes the Hives the Strokes kind mm. of garagey like the term garage rock was always kind of thrown around with us and then yeah we I mean we did okay in Europe but um, but not I think if we would have kept going regular it would have been a lot better but I don't know. We that's that's one of many business mistakes we made over the years. <laughs> but it's real scary when you're like, you know, when you go over there, uh, it was when we were cuz that that first tour was like a real like wing and a prayer and we just felt like we saved up all our money and then I think we just we were touring so much and the guy I think we had booked with stopped booking like a couple years later. We didn't know who to go with, and he he had like f- somehow fronted most of the money for our plane tickets on that first tour, and we were like, well, when we go back, we want to have a record out over there, and we want to have somebody front the plane tickets, and 
we didn't have either one of those and in retrospect like we didn't you didn't need that it would have it would all come back but it is scary when you're like yeah all right we're gonna put up you know thousands of dollars to go do this thing it's like and be 10 gone. grand sometimes at least yeah. yeah totally 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 and then get merch made over there and you're committed to paying a guy to drive you around and just all that stuff and and i don't know but but yeah, I think, and I, I know, de- I know that like, you know, metal is so much, you know, it's. Yeah, I think it's pretty big right now in the states, but like, it seems like it's just even tenfold. In and it's such a weird thing in Europe. There's like, you'll meet like some super hipster guy, and he's like, my favorite uh, three bands are, and he'll name off like three bands that you've you know that you've barely heard of that are just starting to make you know that that aren't even the buzz on pitchfork but will be in like you know a couple months and then it'll be like Mm -hmm. you know it'll be like the shady desert boys they've only played japan and then you know this this band that's like super cool and then good charlotte and you're like what like yo good (laughs) charlotte they're geniuses and it's like this weird divide of like you like the three hipsterest things ever and, you know, some 41 or something. And it just makes absolutely yeah. no sense. So that I guess that, their, their really tastes are just funny. really, like, they're definitely not encumbered uh, by any of the, like, genre, I don't know, genre things that, that we have over here. To, no, to a not fault. at all. They, they just, they just kind of like everything. Like, yeah. in, I don't know, I, I, I can tell this story in its entirety, but I don't know. It's uh, like... Uh, sometimes when bands um, like are in a town if there's two different tours and they're booked on the same night the promoters will get this genius idea to combine both shows into a festival yeah and so uh, The Sword was on a tour uh, at one time and then Papa Roach was like headlining their own tour and then the promoter in Fargo, North Dakota thought it'd be a great idea to throw both band- both tours together and uh, you know the, the money's right and you're just like yeah. well fuck it you know you do it and then like I just remember at the end of the night uh, Papa Roach uh, headlined the show and I think like eleven people had stuck around oh, for man. them. It was just—I mean, it was—it was a bloodbath, dude. We call that one deadlining when when, when the headliner has, has zero crowd. But yeah. then, like, literally six weeks later, we were on a European tour, and uh, we played a show in Austria. And uh, our stage—it was uh, Fiddler, The Sword, Coheed and Cambria. And it was, you know, I figured it was going to be a you know great show. And th- it was in a field that could probably hold maybe like. I don't know, 10, 15,000 people. And there was maybe a thousand people there, even for Coheed. I mean, just like, like sprinkled throughout, you know what I mean? It looked like nothing. It looked like yeah. absolutely nothing. And then on the other side of the field, it was a Papa Roach corn and like Lincoln park, I think. And do we, uh, we wanted the, the sound guy for, uh, Papa Roach at the time was a friend of ours and we knew he had the weed. So we're like, let's go get the weed. And uh, we went over to the Papa Roach set, and there was like thirty thousand kids just going ape shit. You <laughs> yeah. know, I just, it's it's so weird, like, <laughs> but, yeah, uh, you know, just from town to town, country to country, whatever. It's like you know, you, you never know what you're gonna get when yeah, you hop you in the really van and, and go play some shows. And I wonder how that oh, happens if they're just like, I don't. It's it, it is it is weird how that that like that thing trends in that direction sometimes i was i was like i fell down a a a youtube hole and i was watching just some video of limp biscuit playing to like i mean it just looked like you know thirty thousand people and it was and it was like Mm -hmm. last year or like you know or like a year before the pandemic (laughs) and it, it was somewhere in europe or brazil or something like that and just that Man, I, I just I need to I need to get out of town, man. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, dude. What? Uh, but then you know, as as things do, they wind down, and yeah. uh, you have to start yeah looking at other projects and stuff, and just like or just wondering like kind of what the next thing is. But it, it's funny how like you just I don't I'm sure you've had this experience, but when you're in a band for so long and you're just grinding and going and going and going, like time kind of stops, like. Yeah, like I, I still feel in my head like I'm like still 20 years old. I do too. You know, and I'm, I'm like looking at 40 now. You know, and it's yeah. just, it's funny. Like when you when when you do take a step back and you like try to start a new project, you're like, wait, how old am I now? How I like know. what? Like how much work does this take? And then it just sort of like just because your perspective is so different because you've been around the world so many times and just have signed those contracts you shouldn't have signed and learned your lessons and everything. And it just kind of 
Yeah, I just it, it, it takes it all back to that DIY uh, yeah. kind of mentality of where like you know I I I I too think that I you know I wish I had a, a team of people handling all this and maybe if we did it would work better but. I don't know. I've seen it go so wrong so many times where like, you know, you're, you're upset because your publicist isn't getting you the press that you want to get, but like maybe this, that's just not going to happen anyway or whatever. It's just, there's so many crazy variables to, yeah, to being in a band. Yeah, for sure. I've definitely gotten a lot more comfortable with, uh, not beating myself up over any of those, um, mistakes, you know, like I don't, I don't really, I mean, yeah, I think that was a mistake, but also, like, that was all the knowledge I had about doing any of this stuff at the time, you know? Like, there's mm-hmm. only, you don't come into any of this, and, and on top of that, like, the the game, the game is always changing, you know? <laughs> like, uh, which is also a frustrating and weird thing now of, like, you know, Dracula's is a relatively new band, and, and uh, just doing, like, kind of working on new projects, and I want to... You know, I, I'm I'm realistic uh, about the expectations of of what those can do, but it's also like I know there's a way to get this out to more people. I just don't know anything. I anything that I did learn about playing the game, like I don't. It's a new game now. Like I don't know how. You know, I'm, I mean, I'm not so daft that I don't know. Like social media is important or whatever. But like, there's still just like I'm sure so many tricks and tips that. I wish I did know, you know. I I'll say that just from from my experience and just my just from watching the industry wind down and everything. I'm going to go I'm going to spill the beans, y'all. If, if any anybody out there wants to know how shit's going right now, um basically there's there's at least 3. There's probably a couple more, but there's three giant label conglomerates that are buying up every single record label and, and those libraries that come along with those labels in the hopes that eventually they're going to own as much shit as possible that is streaming. So they're basically destroying record labels or, or at least turning a record label from from a team of people that have like a marketing department, a uh, press, you know, the, uh, the manufacturing, sales, all that stuff is basically getting wiped out down to two people who are just going to be sitting in a room counting streams. And that's going to be what a record label is pretty soon. So signing to a label, like I, I just don't understand what the advantage would be these days unless you were some kind of crazy like huge pop star or like had, had the ambition to be some huge pop star yeah. because you're, you're way better off e- even in, even in those cases, probably just like garnering your own following and just keeping as much money as possible. I remember uh, the Macklemore when, when his record got huge, he owned that record and it sold 10 million copies back when you could sell copies. I mean, that's literally like a hundred million dollars in the bank. You know, if you would assign to a label, that would have spent, you know, like $3 million marketing your record, you would have made $10 million, but that's a 10th of a hundred million, you know? And then yeah. e- even then, so it's, it, it's, it's crazy how that works because in, in those, those major, la- even the, the big major labels left like Sony or, or whatever, like, you know, they're, they, they have, let's say they, they have a $3 million marketing budget for that year or whatever. And like, they're going to spend like 2.9 million of that on Katy Perry. Yeah, because they need her to work, you know, and so the rest of the hundred bands on that label, they're left to split that hundred thousand dollars in, you know, from the marketing. And so that's why, you know, you're going to think that you sign this major label deal. And like next thing you know, you've got like a ten thousand dollar marketing budget. And, you know, good luck trying to make a music video with that or yeah. anything like that. Or even if you did make a video, who the fuck would play it? You know, yeah. it's, 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 uh, the, I think Neil, uh, from clutch, he said, you know, it's like the, the game didn't really change from like the seventies all the way up until probably like 1999, you know, yeah. like <laughs> once like 2000 hit in the last 20 years, it's just been changing so rapidly that it's, it's, it's impossible to keep up with. And, uh, yeah, I, I have no idea where it's going. That's, that's another yeah, thing. Yeah. I don't either. Like it's, it's I don't either. hard to predict. And it's it was hard, hard to predict. To know, anyway. like, I, I don't know, you know, I don't really, I know there's some people out there that kind of follow what I do or what the gamblers do. Like the gamblers are talk the gamblers are just starting to um, write some new stuff um, very slowly. And we're gonna do something. We're gonna do another record. We just recorded some some stuff and that kinda like got everybody nice. got you back in the room and doing stuff. Um, yeah. We recorded a cover of uh, Jerry Rafferty's Ride Right Down the Line. <laughs> and Whoa, um, really? 
Yeah, we and actually we recorded a uh, uh, that was for like a like a compilation, and then we also recover we recorded um, we recorded uh, Bonzo goes to Bitburg, and Ian like took a yes. shot in the dark, and we got C J Ramon to do backup vocals on it. Which no is way! Insane! I'm still freaking out that, over that, that. That's one of my favorite Ramones songs. Oh, I, so a lot of people good. bag on the uh, the later period Ramones, but I like every Ramones record. I, I like, all yeah, great. me too. Me, me too. I mean, there's there's some the 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 albums are less consistent hits, but there are there's nothing less than three like amazing songs on every single Ramones record. Somebody put something in my drink is one of my favorites. Yeah. Like for, I think that one's on Too Tough to Die. Yeah. I don't want anything colored pink. That just stinks. <laughs> <laughs> gold. Oh, uh, yeah. Gold, but, gold but, yeah, so, you. you know, but I don't know, like, what, I don't know how we'll roll, roll that out. Like, um, I mean, we're going to do a little bit of experimenting by putting that that cover out uh, on our own. Um and uh, just completely on our own. Like we've done stuff with little labels that are just friends, but we're gonna try and just do this on our own. So I, you know, the idea of doing a full Good. length is really, it's a little like for something of for that band, it's it's sort of it's more nerve wracking. Like it's not a big deal when I'm doing like you know some little one off garage rocky kind of project, but um, like I don't know, just the idea of like so we're getting the publicist and all that. I'm a, I'm a little overwhelmed by it, but I mean, and I'm not even sure, like maybe somebody will kind of come in and, and want to do something and we'll like what they're, what they're trying to give us. But I don't know. I'm also like kind of into the adventure of trying something on our own. You should do it. You should totally do it on your own. It's, it's totally doable and it's, uh, it's really rewarding. It, it feels great once it's done and out and you realize that it didn't really, take a whole lot of doing there's you know other steps to do but yeah you know what once you know how to do that you just know you know how to do it and you're, yeah. you're you're wiser and and it's a lot of fun dude i could talk to you for like six hours probably about this shit <laughs> yeah <laughs> but but we should probably wrap it up is there anything uh i mean I, I don't know if you have any gamblers tracks up from that you'd want to play but is there any uh, do you have any dracula's tracks or anything else you got going on that you want to play a song for the oh, people out man. there what do you got going on right now uh well I've got uh yeah I mean I guess maybe maybe Dracula's because that's the newest thing that's out right now that gambler stuff is it, it's gonna come out why don't you have me back on sometime in a couple months and I'll I'll and we'll do that's a, a deal uh, a gambler's thing uh uh but maybe a Dracula song we could do uh there's a song called Level Up that we did a video for uh, oh no no no. Nice. We're doing a video right now for this Dracula song. It's called Dark Black. The, the record came out like the record came out like basically day two of the pandemic. It was like <laughs> April. <laughs> so that was that was. I great. don't mean to laugh. I'm sorry. no. It, it is oh, funny. It God. is calm. And we actually got super lucky because we we had a tour booked, and then the record got pushed back, and the tour was just barely booked. And they were like, well, do you want to try and cancel the tour? Like, it's early enough to cancel it, and it wouldn't be a big deal, but it's too late to, like, book dates, like, three weeks later. I was like, nah, let's right. just, you know, we're not really, that band's not big enough to do one of those, like, pre-album release tours. But I was like, but you know what? It's uh -huh. booked. Let's do it. And I'm so happy that we did, because we, it was like, we. I remember driving home, like, you know, driving home in early March and going like, people are making such a big deal of this COVID thing. Is this just going to be like, I this know. is going to be like bird flu, you know, this is going to be like Y2K all over again. Uh, and, you know, here we are. <laughs> that was the last yeah, show. Like, that was the last show. Almost a year later. The last Jesus. time I performed in front of people. Actually, I take it back because me and you, did JT's road stories? I think like uh, the the week later. That, that was like in February. Yeah, that, that was like that was yeah that was the last gig. That, that was we the ripped. official and, last uh, gig. Yeah, um, yeah. Wow, our last show was together. Our last live show oh. in front of humans. Um, uh, but yeah, we'll do so it again. Um, I don't know. I but I have kind of like gone back and you know you know what I'm gonna start. I'm gonna do a, like a second round of music videos for that band. Um, I kind of got, you know, I went through a little bit of a depression with all this COVID stuff, but I, this year, 
I'm uh, starting to feel shaked off and like writing songs again and leaning into Good. projects. And I'm 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 kind of feeling like we're gonna have a better year. I think. I hope. We are gonna have a better year. Uh, it, come hell or high water, I'm gonna have a better year. Yeah, me I too. can't have another year like last year. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> no, no uh, alternatives. Um, but dude, thanks so much for hopping in here and talking. Yeah, we gotta have you back once the gamblers uh, get get a record together. And because, uh, like I said, we we got stories for days, man. I know we, we, we do. Yeah, we barely scratched know, the right? surface. I'll have to have you. Uh, I'll have to have you, me and Zach. Blair are doing a podcast uh, that's going to drop real soon where we just have people come on and talk about three, just three things that they're into, and we will be getting you on uh, ASAP. Hell yeah. It's what I do. I talk now. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's like, well, when are you going to play guitar? I was like, I still do that, too. I'm just talking right now, okay? Man? Yeah, it's just talking. Uh, but, uh, You're going to have to yeah, get a talk but, but, box and combine both. <laughs> Hold your wow. Have you ever played I'll with have one a of weird those? Three way podcast. Yeah, if you don't have it hardwired into your amp, it'll explode your teeth if uh, you play a note wrong that resonates with your enamel. It's fucking crazy. Be careful with those things if you've got one out there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right, man. Take it easy, bud. Thanks so much for coming. All right, man. Here. much for tuning into the highway this week a big shout out to reverend guitars rail hammer pickups and earthquaker devices if you liked what you heard you can follow where you can follow subscribe where you can subscribe and if you want to go one step further you can support us on patreon at the highway with kyle shut for a few bucks a month you can help us keep this party going get early access to next week's episode and even get yourself a shout out <laughs>